Well, Did you try it's... tasting it, Katie? Do you know what it tastes like? It's grape flavored. I promise you. Don't I'm do gonna... it. <laughs> <laughs> Happy New Comic Book Day, geeks, and welcome to issue 19 of the Script Heroes podcast. The show where we bring you comic news, book reviews, and of course, industry blues. My name is Joseph Chasenowski, and I'm the writer of Janet Hero, Cunning Carly, and the Cryptoverse. And I'm Katie Markham, scripter of the Rusty Robot Country Club and ghostwriter extraordinaire. Today, we are talking about DC's April spell. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Ape. Real special. Very important pun there. <laughs> important distinction. Uh, Lotus Land number five and The Displaced number two. And for the back issue review this week, we are talking about volume one of the Mirage era Teenage Ninja Turtles. Uh, I'm very excited for that. Yeah, and I believe this is a custom volume one that you've curated. It is curated. a custom volume one that, yeah. I've, that I've curated. Um. Yes, yeah, so it's like issues one <laughs> through four or something. Uh, uh, one, be- two, three, and, and the Raphael one shot. But yes, yes, that's right. I knew that there were four books that I, I had to read. Uh, but yeah. yeah, in our creator corner, we'll be joined by the creators of the new comic, Can I Scream? Jonathan Hedrick and Francesca Fatini. Very fun interview. There. Not to yeah, not to to get too far ahead of ourselves, but a very very cool comic book that we will yes. talk about more in depth at the end of this episode. So. And if you enjoy that interview or anything else in this episode, you can follow the pod on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, all at the handle Script Heroes Pod. Or you can find me personally on all the same socials at JJAZ1111. And you can find me on also all the same at Katie Markham Pro. And now... Let's get into the news. Okay, we have another kind of slow news week, so I'm going to be tackling a bit of news for a book, or I should say books, that we are reading currently on the podcast. So this regards The One Hand and The Six Fingers. It has been announced that these two interconnected comic books with separate creative teams will be collected within a combined trade paperback in alternating comic format instead of in their own trades which i mean i think that fully tracks i think that um having read two issues of uh the The one one hand and only the the one that's out of the six fingers i do think that if you're looking for the whole story it's going to make the most sense to read them alternating the way that they're being released uh yeah and i i I, I, I think yeah just really cool to see uh a different way of putting books out. I think that anytime we see creators and publishers experimenting with, um, with what the comic medium can be, it's super cool. And with something that is, you know, episodic coming out monthly, uh, mixing it up with the way that it's being released is one of those cool innovations that you want to see. And so it makes sense that when they're collecting it, that they preserve that feeling as well. That's 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 very true. What I want to say is, like, to me, it, in, because while you said that to get the full story, it feels like you're gonna have to read both. I'm gonna slightly disagree with the first three issues. Like, I don't think if you read the first two issues of the one hand, you'd feel like you were missing the six mm-hmm. fingers. To me, this indicates a greater level of interconnectedness coming. That is my you know feeling on this announcement um also i don't know if i said it there or not so i'm just gonna say it again the trade will be called the one hand and the six fingers they are not giving like a it is literally just called the one hand and the six fingers just want to throw that out there it's a little lame i feel like they could have come up with a with a, with a cool <laughs> combined name i i i agree i you know i might even just call it i i guess the thing is with different creative teams you don't want to just give it one of the book's titles because that would be a little no but like call it the six-fingered hand or something ah yeah they got like my my mindset would have been like i would have assumed it it would have just been called the one hand with like you know the six fingers also being in there because like you know i don't know six fingers on one hand the six fingers also just feels very much like it is the in, and I'm saying this with love because I did enjoy the six fingers more. So I feel like I can say this without it sounding like I'm trying to hand wave the six fingers. The six hand fingers wave? feels very much like it is the other, yeah, the other side of the, you know, uh, of the, I'll say of the hand instead of of the coin. Um, <laughs> like it very much feels like the one hand is like the primary and then the six fingers yeah. is like the Something thing to it. Yeah. So 
that's my that was my initial thought process. But in any case, don't really care what it's called because you know I was gonna say I'm gonna pick it up unless it has extra material. I probably won't pick it up because I'm gonna have yeah, all the all issues. <laughs> so why? Um, and like it's wrong. It's not Ninja Turtles, so I don't buy the this... collected and the individual issues. There you go. <laughs> And like I knew it was some indie, so I'm like, oh, like within Hell We Fight, we got the, uh, uh, you got mm. the trade of that. And it's like, okay, what is an indie I creator? Who's that had like, extra material though, that had all of the, uh, the, the stories that were in the image books, shot. and I was like, you know what? By the time I buy like the, the the couple of image issues, like it's not that much more to just get the trade, so I might as well, you know, support it and and do that. So that was my thought process, anyway. Yeah, no, super cool. I am uh, very excited to see how this experiment pans out. Uh, we don't too, have an issue from that series this week, though. Uh, but we do have yeah. three other books to talk about over in that we the do. Pull List Rack. Let's go! All right, here we are at the Pull List Rack. What a thrill. We've got three great books. <laughs> uh, gray, a, gray a, a Grape. We have a grape-flavored grape book. book. Well, it's banana-scented, uh, but grape-flavored. Uh, that's right, because yeah, one of the yeah. books we're reading this Did, did you try it's... tasting it, Katie? Do you know what it tastes like? It's grape flavored, I promise you. Don't I'm do gonna... it! <laughs> 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 the absolute <laughs> impulse <laughs> to lick the book. I didn't even get the, the banana scented one. Uh, uh, though, what if, what it's, if there's still oh, one at my comic shop next week, I might get it. Uh, but yeah, so we've got the April special from DC. <laughs> uh, we've got Lotus Land, number five. And we've got the displaced number two. Yes. Uh, but that's of course not all we picked up this week. Jaybird. No, it is not. I got Cobra Commander number three. I got Green Lantern War Journal number seven. Rebel Moon House of the Blood Axe number three. Something Epic number eight. And one of my most anticipated books for a long time now is I got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Untold Destiny of the Foot Clan number one, which uh, has Mateo Santaluco, who's probably my favorite modern Ninja Turtles artist returning to a Ninja Turtles book. So I am Sweet. very, very excited. Yeah. Thrilling. But Katie, what did you pull? I got Beneath the Trees Where Nobody Sees, number uh, four. We've got Dear Editor, number three. We've got uh, The Infernals, number two, which we talked about last month and Jay didn't like enough to pull again. Uh, so if anyone I'm out sorry. there really likes <laughs> The Infernals, please DM me. I want to talk to people about it. Uh, then a few new number ones. We've got Man's Best, Numero Uno. Uh, it's full of dogs, unsurprising. Uh, Dawn Runner, number one, and Deeprog, number one. Had a lot going on this week. But for the yeah. three that we'll be talking about on the show, what you feeling? What, what, yes. what kind of order are you looking at? I I think we start with the April special because you know let's let's just let's get the eight puns right out in front. And then I say we, we go and we, we go to uh, the penultimate issue of Lotus Land and we finish it out with uh, the second issue of The Displaced. That is, that is my, my mindset. Sounds perfect to me. I'm thrilled that I nice. get the privilege and honor of reading this abomination of a summary. I've, I've read it once before when it was announced, so it really is your turn. <sighs> let's go, let's go, uh, let's go ape, I guess. Let's go bananas. That works too. <laughs> I hate us both. Get ready to go bananas in this ape ick adventure. Caution, an absurd amount of bad ape puns are incoming. Please be apevised. Gorilla Grodd's recent incarceration in the pages of The Flash has left a void that Monsieur Mala is more than happy to fill. Ape assembling a group of the DCU's most sinister simians, Mala forms the Legion of Do U U A A M, with the eye towards world domination. But the world won't be conquered that easily. Enter the all ape jungle, Lee -e Eeg. Can this team of heroic anthropoids be the salvation we need? Or will Mala's team of maniacal monkeys bring forth the ape apocalypse? Get ready to go bananas as we honor DC's storied history with mankind's closest relatives in this epic adventure. 
it is so funny to hear you say that instead of you know having to be the one to read it <laughs> that that was thoroughly entertaining it was it was quite a lot to get through and i think that we can blame a lot of that on the vibes that a friend of the show john layman brought to the book uh he's one of the writers yes. uh as well as joshua hale uh filakov and gene len yang the artists are Ka uh, Carl Mostert, Phil Hester, Eric Gapster, and Bernard Chang. The colorists are David Barron, Dee Knife, and Marcello Maiolo. The letters are Tom Napolitano, Kate, uh, Clayton Cowles, and Janice Chang. So many ape puns just got me all tongue-tied. Yeah, we've got three stories in here. Uh, Jay, how would you feel about the, the, the ape real special? Let me let me start by doing a little bit of a plug because I think with how stupid and I say stupid with love, the the idea of this book is it is carried by I think how well that humor is balanced with good storytelling. Yes. So let me give a, a quick little plug to if you want to see an interview with one of the writers on this book, John Layman, where he does briefly talk about the book, uh, it'll be popping up uh, in the video now. Yes, it'll um, also be available also on your like, feed. Hello. Uh, if, yes. you're, if you're listening in audio format. Uh, yeah, John Lehman, an absolute talent in balancing comedy and story. And it's stupid how well he does it in this book, too. Because uh, it is just a bunch of... It's a bunch of monkeys. Like It's a bunch of monkeys, but it's it's really, like, well-built. Yeah. Weirdly, the, the art's awesome all the way through. The art and, is like, so good. To, like, like, I'm going to say this as, like, an extra compliment and not a slight to John Lehman's story, which is the, the big bulk story. Mm -hmm. I don't even think it's the best story in the book. I think the Detective Chimp story is the best the story Detective in the book. Chimp I think the story Detective Chimp story is so somehow good. just god tier. Like, just, like, a, right? one of the best short comics you'll, like, ever read. It somehow was, in the was... middle of this <laughs> ape pun book. I was like, what is happening? I was like, right? Is... It reminded me like, so this much is of... Like 10 um... out of 10 level, like, 9 out of I had a 10 level comic right here. I was like, what right? is happening? Specifically, the Detective Chimp one reminded me of uh, that iconic issue of Sandman, where it's like two people in a car and just this tension between them. Yes. And, like, it achieves it and so, so well. much tension. And, like, <laughs> Detective Chimp's, like, little, you know, like, conning and, like, building out the detective. I was like, what is happening? How is this this good? Right? And the art on that chapter two just really built it and drove it mm -hmm. home the moment toward the beginning where you like see kind of the murder but you don't really see the murder like you see the scene and stuff so good so well fucking built like just i am and and, and i'll now pull it to the whole story i am shocked by how good this was right like we've read uh, a number of anthology books uh on the pad and off it uh you know like they do their little summer yeah. specials they do their pride specials uh, they did their they were all the like Day offshoot one. ones from uh, Beast World, which were kind of similar in this, where like something like tied together. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to bring up specifically because you look at that, and it's like that was the main event happening at DC at the time, and those were a little, they were a little inconsistent. They weren't super engaging in the greater story, and then you look at this stupid monkey pun book, and they're like amazing, and it's good, <laughs> and it's, it's so, so good. good, like. It, I'm going to sound like I'm joking, but one of the best books DC has put out in 2024 so far, at least that I've read, which is wild to say. It's absurd. Because it's, it's like, built it as, so good. and should be, like just stupid puns. And there are a number of stupid puns, And it's full of stupid especially. puns outside of, the, uh, outside of the Detective Chimp story. I yeah. think that's the only one that wasn't really full of puns. But yeah. like the main story, full of puns, but all good again like yeah. it's fantastically illustrated it's chaptered really nicely and like these nice little like chunks of like mm -hmm. each having a nice little ending and then a great opening to the next like little arc in there like i i i i sound shocked because i am shocked by how Same. good this was <laughs> but you know what i am thrilled to be so surprised by it um yeah i had so much fun reading this like you said the art the writing all of it just comes together, even having, like, the three separate stories yeah. that cohesive. My first exposure to Monkey Prince, too, who I know you yeah, like, yeah. But, but this is my first exposure to Monkey Prince, and 
very cool character from what I was, Absolutely. you know, introduced to here. Has his own story at the end, which was mm-hmm. also really cool and fun and interesting. Um, yeah, good. Just Top good all around. Are, do you feel ready to give a give a give a rating and yeah. a uh, a rack? Yeah, yeah. It's it's always hard to rate anthologies, um, mm-hmm. even more so than normal books. Like I said, the Detective Chimp story. Give a special shout out for being one of the best short comics I've ever read. Like just no joke, no qualifier on that. Just one of the best short comics I've ever read. Um, but as a whole, really, really good. I gave this an 8.5 out of 10. And I will oh, give it baby. a very strong pull list rack. <laughs> because this was awesome, honestly. Yeah. I'm going to echo your sentiments. I only gave it an 8. But, you know, it's an 8 for what was supposed to be, like, an April Fool's joke book. Uh, so yeah. truly out of nowhere and absolutely a pull list rack. Go grab yourself a copy of the April special. Uh, yeah, maybe even this. one that's Holy literally shit. banana scented. <laughs> Yeah, again, should have just been a dumb, fun joke that we all could have laughed at, but, like, it's really good, which, like, the entire creative team, top to bottom, deserves a lot of credit, but for that main story, I just gotta be like, when you put John Lehman on a book, no matter how stupid it is, it's gonna have heart to it, too, so, you know, shout out. Shout out, this book was, in fact, goo-oo-oo-ah-ah-d. Had to end with an eight pun. Let's move into Lotus Land number Lotus Land number five. As the series approaches the highly anticipated conclusion, Tabitha and Ethan continue to struggle through their strained relationship and her inability to see his new body as anything but an imposter. Meanwhile, Benny and Wickstorm uncover more details in the Drowning Girls case, and through a more esoteric form of interrogation, Benny discovers some devastating answers concerning the missing children. The writer is Dan- Darcy Van Holgeist, Little Bird, Critical Role, The Tales of Exandria. Uh, the artist is Chow Felipe. Stranger Things, Superman, Nightwing. The colorist is Patricio Del Pecci. And the letterer is Nate Picos. This has been a little bit of a weird book for us to review, I feel like. We, we've had, you know, our concerns and the things we really, really have loved about this book. But it's been kind of all over the place. So I'm, I'm interested to hear how the penultimate issue felt to you, Katie. So... I've said this before with Lotus Land, and it feels like a me problem that I haven't rectified it. it I, every time I pick up a new issue of it, I feel a little bit lost. I feel like I should have reread the ones before it to really get the impact of the current issue. Like, there's just so much going on that it's hard to, month to month, really kind of keep it all together here and it does a very elegant job of like writing and uh, presenting information but in that elegance there is you know it's it's not as direct so it is easy to kind of forget little bits that you've read a month or two or three or five months ago yeah no i think i think that's a super uh fair criticism of of it but it's it's an interesting thing because it, it's it's just very confusing to me, I think, most of the time. Like, what I'm supposed to be understanding mm-hmm. and what is supposed to be kind of part of the mystery and part of the intrigue of the world. So that's kind of my main gripe with it. Um, it does add some allure to the book of, like, ah, mm-hmm. you can't really tell what's going on. But then there's also the bit of, like, ah, I'm five issues in and I can't really tell what's going on sometimes, <laughs> which is, you know, a, a rough thing, I think. But mm-hmm. it... It's such a weird book to review. Uh, But it's such a good book, is what I keep coming back to, is that I enjoy it so much. I think that the art is just phenomenal. I think that the world is super interesting. The fact that I really have no idea where the mystery is going is frustrating, but also so intriguing. Like, all all of the parts of this book work so well for me. And I just... I'm really excited to read it once it's done, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think that this is a book that will lend itself more to the trade than it yeah. has to being a monthly release. Um, mm. But I'm also not willing to hand wave away the, the, the problem because of like, ah, these problems happen. No, yeah. Like they chose to release the book monthly. So, you know, <laughs> this is this is where we land. It's a, mm-hmm. I do want to say I do still love the art and I love a lot of the yep. art in this issue in particular. 
but um yeah i don't know it's it's i'm getting i get like i think a little bit more pulled out each issue that i'm like still Mm -hmm. confused and still you know vying to figure out what the hell is going on and see i think that if it were you know 12 issues i might feel that but with six issues i still feel myself leaning in every issue being like oh shit lotus landers this week hell yeah uh like i'm very excited to read it every time uh and I think for issue six, I'll try to 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 be on top of rereading before Just rereading going. everything. Yeah. yeah, really make that ending kick. <laughs> uh, speaking <laughs> but, of which, do you want to rate the book? Yeah, yeah. I I really do. Just I like this book so much. I like what's going on with it. I love the art and the world. I think that it's a really great book. The, the problems are problems, though, so I'm going to sit it at a 7 out of 10. And we've been saying it literally since issue 2 of this book. Absolutely not. Do not pick up issue 5 of this book. You need no. to start from the beginning. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I laid a little bit worse than you because I think my personal enjoyment of the book uh, is just not super high anymore. Like, I can, there's the, it feels like a well-made book, so I don't want to, like, trash it. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, my enjoyment is, is really going down when I'm just like trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Um, so I landed on a 5.5 out of 10. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I would not call it a poll list wreck, not just because I don't think you should jump in here, but because I don't love being confused for five issues. Maybe you do. If you like being confused for five issues, this is, this is the book for you, but that's not, that's not my favorite thing in the world. Um, Fair but enough. speaking of confusion, characters are very confused in the displaced. They so let's sure are. Uh, hop over there. Number two. The survivors of the Oshawa, Ontario disappearance are few and far between, and those that don't stick together continue to vanish without a trace. Down to a final 12, what will the remaining desperate group do to survive in a world where, by all verifiable means, they don't exist? The writer here is Ed Brisson of Ghost Rider, Iron Fist, and Extermination. The artist is Luca Castellaguida of 007 James Bond, Dylan Dog, and Lost Soldiers. The colorist is D. Kimife, and the letterer is Hassan Osman Alau. Jay, you loved issue one of The Displaced. That I did. I feel about issue two. I really like this issue too. I, I am really, really enjoying the series. I think it's a really cool idea, and I think the way that it's being executed is very good. It's got a great uh, opening few pages. I like the hook of just us seeing our two main characters and kind of getting their um, perspective as they see that people are forgetting them and not just mm-hmm. the city as a whole, which is really cool. And then they introduce concept of like, if they stick together, they'll remember each other and thus like stay in existence. But if they split up and everybody forgets them, then they will literally like fade from existence. Yeah. So cool. There's one dude who's like not willing to believe it and he wants to like go and he holds this like TV station hostage at knife point to try to like preach to everybody that like ah ashra exists super cool i thought this but issue the problem went is really, that really as well. soon as someone leaves the tv station like someone leaves the room to like grab the cops or something and they immediately forget him as well They're like oh i think it was a bomb threat or something why did i come out here and then they come yeah. back in, and it's it also pulls back in the uh one of the police officers from the first issue uh who was helping them his parents lived in ashwa so i'm really intrigued by what that angle is going to be. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll obviously be seeing the displaced themselves uh, trying to hold, hold on to being remembered and remembering each other. But I'm really excited to see kind of from an outside view, almost this like mystery of what's going on with Absolutely. this like hole in memory. Uh, Cause I, I, I it, it's, it's so cool. Yeah, you see the one guy who's like concept. buying stuff from a gas station and the dude literally <laughs> forgets that he paid for the gas. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, someone's pumping on number 10. Who do you think fucking paid you? And then like an icon, he's like, oh, you don't remember me? And it was 10 seconds ago and we are hungry and out of money. Oh, should I? It was, it was a good moment. And I like that we're seeing so many different people being affected by this. And I think that was yes. obviously a very intentional thing from the creators is having just everyone seems affected in a different way 
And I think that that's a really cool way to go about this, like, absolutely insane situation that they're all in. Fully agree. Fully agree. And, like, there's, I don't want to get spoilery, but there's some really, yeah. really cool moments kind of in the, in the, in the ending of this issue oh, yeah. that really, I think, lead us in a really cool mm-hmm. stuff to come. So I just, I love this kind of top to bottom. I think the art works really well for what this book is doing. Agreed. Which is, and you know, so another style. really great thing. It's, it's a very and cool it, style. It's very well. I think in a, a direct contrast to Lotus Land, this also fits so well in the monthly format. Like they've, yes. they end the books on these really good cliffhangers and there's not like a lot to forget I guess, funnily enough, for the concept <laughs> of the book. Uh, so it really feels like you're picking right back up where you where you left off when you pick it up again. Yeah, fully agree. I like this book a lot. You want to give it Me a rating? Too. Sure. I, I laid out an 8.5 out of 10 for this Ooh. issue. I thought this was a really, really good issue. I loved it. Um, I'm trying to think now if this is jump onable or not. <sighs> I'm kind of torn. I don't think it's going to be the best experience to jump on here. Like, I would definitely go back the one issue. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's inaccessible, though. Yeah, I'll throw it a pull this rack. Why not? I I gave it an 8 out of 10. I liked it a lot. Um, I don't know that I would call it a pull list rack. Again, it's very good. But it's also, you know, issue 2. You don't have a lot to catch up on if, <laughs> uh, you're, if you're interested. So I'd very say true. no pull list rack. Just double down on the pull list rack of issue one. <laughs> very fair. Very fair. But that's going to bring us to the end of uh, the pull list rack as a whole. You want to move into the back issue review and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's, it's, it's turtle time. I, I tried to do a Power Rangers joke, but I realized that I don't know the Power Rangers all that well either. I don't either. You, it's this was, this it's was the clock. There's they gotta have, be like, some they, sort of they, they stupid. Like a, a... This is what I was going for. Turtle time. I don't oh, know. Is turtle it mania. Just turtle time. Oh is yeah, let's engage in mania? turtle mania. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Here's an These show. four brothers are just like you, except they're ninja and turtles. Follow Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael, and Michelangelo as they try to avenge their father's master against his murderer, Oroku Saki, also known as the Shredder. Then follow them meet new friends, Casey Jones and April O'Neil, as they take on Mousers, Police, and Street Thugs. This is the start of the greatest independent comic franchise of all time. (laughs) This is, of course, done by two men, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. They all do... They both do all of the jobs on all of the pages, which makes no conceivable sense to anyone except for them, but they fully stand by the fact that that is how it was made. And so that is how it was made. Um, I love the Ninja Turtles. I love the Mirage Ninja Turtles. I love Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. Katie, this is your first exposure to any of these things in any significant degree. So um, how did you feel? It's also black and white, which I know. It's more gray tone than black and white. Exactly. It's it's, It's it's, tone. Yeah. Uh, What struck me, because this is the, other than the Batman first volume crossover with uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, here's in a half shell. Uh, This is the first Turtles comic I'm reading. I have seen chunks, bits, pieces of. Yeah, you said you watched the 2003 show. Yes. Which is just a yeah. straight adaptation, pretty much, of the Mirage That's run. what I was going to say. It's wild to read, because we read the first three issues and then the uh, Raph Solo story uh, for this little custom volume one. And it is crazy how, like, beat for beat the 2003 oh, yeah. 2003 is of this. That's why yeah. I love 2003 uh, so much. Yeah, and it's it's so fucking good. Uh, like, it right? really, I'm glad it you really so. just is. It's so I good. Mean, <laughs> it's one of those absurd things where, like, they literally made this just in, essentially, like, in a garage, right? Or in a basement In, in, in a house. They bought a little house 
called it Mirage Studios as a joke because they didn't actually have a studio, so it was a Mirage. Fucking Kevin Eastman scribbled down when they couldn't come up with ideas. They were trying to get Fugitoid off the ground, which is a character in the next arc of this, which I'm sure we'll lead at some point. Um, they couldn't really come up with stuff. Kevin Eastman drew a little turtle with nunchucks as a joke to try to like make Peter Laird laugh. And then Peter Laird drew his version and then just Ninja Turtles. And it is so dumb that it became it one of the greatest It has no right to be so time. good for something called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like, obviously we are all desensitized to the concept of yes. the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But listen to that shit. Teenage oh, yeah. Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's, it's stupid ridiculous. as shit and it's so good. Like and, and, the... and I, I, it's so. I think, I think it comes down to just that Kevin Eastman and Peter Lay are like two of the most talented men ever make comic books. Like it is ridiculous how good they are at every single job in comic books because they do every single job on yeah. this book. It's bonkers because it's it's all hand drawn, obviously, uh, and you can just there's so much technical prowess on the page especially when it comes to things like panel layouts and dynamic action and movement it's all so beautiful and so like it's so professional right out the bat like (sighs) insane the thing i want to say about that is i'm gonna push back a little bit on it being professional because i think the thing that made me fall in love with this is it feels like Peter Lane and Kevin Eastman said, fuck it to every single like thing of this is how you make comics and you have to do mm-hmm. things like this. Like they went, we're going to have a whole page that's just an empty city to show you that they're all gone. Like, don't care if we waste pages. We don't care if it's paced the way that you would pace a mm-hmm. book normally. We don't care about like, it just feels so much like them doing what they wanted to do. Like they grab things from here and there. You've got your, um, your Kirby you know, start on the splash. How do we get in this situation? You have all of these cool, you know, you have your Frank Miller Daredevil influences all throughout it. It is essentially just a parody of Frank Miller Daredevil. Um, And yet it doesn't feel like the, this is what I love about Ninja Turtles. It's a parody that doesn't feel like a parody because it's just so good in its own right. I, I, I'm going to make a slight linguistic twist. When I said professional, I think what I was going for is like, it's so confident like, they oh, yeah. are willing to do these, like, things that I would associate with, like, inexperienced and, like, super, I don't know, well-lauded creative team. But it's, you know, on the first issue of this self-published book. Uh, yeah. Which is, is what really strikes me as so standout in this. Yes. Is that it's... It's... Again, you can literally see the texture of the page on the pages. It, like, you yeah, can tell because that it's made drawn... with the duotone pages. And are, are you familiar with duotone pages? Where uh, no. the way that you get the grays, like, after you draw the way you get the grays, is literally by putting chemicals on the pages to, like, make these grays. And the I, I know too much behind-the-scenes stuff, so I'm just going to keep <laughs> vomiting information out yeah. to you. Um but the funny thing about this is once digital art became a big thing, the company that made Duotone pages uh, discontinued them, I think, in, like, 2009. Mm-hmm. Kevin Eastman bought thousands <laughs> of these pages, and he has them sitting in his garage just so that he can still draw on them now whenever he, you know, draws stuff. Because to this day, his pages in The Last Ronin, his covers that he's done for every single IDW Ninja Turtles issue, are all still, like, done on these these Duotone. Actually, I don't know if the covers are. I know the pages in The Last Ronin were, because that was, like, a big thing that he talked mm-hmm. about. But so much of it's still done on these little Duotone pages that apparently, like, he has to crack a window so the fumes, like, won't <laughs> kill him and kill stuff. Him. Like, it is, it is so unique and interesting the way mm-hmm. that this book is made. And I yes. love it so much. <laughs> no, it really is just... It's so homegrown and so like so genuine i guess yes. is, is something that really comes through like you see someone pick up batman or something it's like yeah they have a passion for the character and whatnot but then you see something like this and you're like this is there's so much energy put into this you can tell that this is like i fully believe because i believe the lore is that they would literally pass pages back and forth like erasing each other's drawings and yeah like, like, like i i i've heard them talk like it's in like the uh the toys that made us documentary like when they went to draw another page like the question they asked is 
do you want to ink or pencil your favorite turtle? Like not this panel, not this thing, but like in each, in the panel with all four turtles, they'd be like, okay, I'm going to pencil this turtle and then pass it to you to ink that turtle. And then you'll pencil the next turtle and then pass it to me to ink that turtle. Like it is so intermittent. And I fully believe it because of how excited the book feels about itself. Like it's, it's kind of a strange thing to glean emotions from uh like it's not the emotions of the turtles coming through you know this is like the emotions of the creators coming through and you can tell how much heart is yes. put into this and how much like how much fun they're having doing it like yes. everything gets cranked up uh you mentioned the pacing before the pacing is insane it is so it is so good at that kind of quiet before the explosion and then that explosion lasts for like 10 pages and it's so drawn out and so good and it's just rad to see how all of the like high energy bits work super well and then the like quieter bits also work super well yeah yeah i want to hit on so many things especially what you just said so i'm gonna like try to take one the first thing is like the, the the intermingling of styles is so cool here because there is a point where like the my funny thing about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is like if I see a piece that's done just by Kevin Eastman I know that it's Kevin Eastman like I know Kevin Eastman's alone style and then I know Peter Laird's alone style but once they start making a book or a page together it is impossible to tell who drew what which is crazy because they are they are very similar stylistically because you know they worked on the same characters and the same thing for so long and like their, their styles are very similar but they're distinctive enough. But once they start working on a page together, it is so indistinguishable to be like, I don't know which turtle on each given page is drawn by which one of them. Don't know. Could never tell you. And that is what is so cool about this to me. Um, I'm also going to jump on, you said you think it's like the emotions of the creators more so than like the, the turtles themselves coming through. I agree to a point. I think one of the cool things about this, and we're not all the way there, but we're, we're starting to get there. I think in issues like, three and four is really where it starts. Mm-hmm. You kind of like feel them finding the personalities of the turtles yeah. as this goes on. And it goes even more through volume one. Like Rast's personality is found pretty early on. Leonardo's is starting to develop. Michelangelo's is very much not there yet, but you start getting little glimpses. Um, and Donnie's is just like, I think in like issue two, it, it peeks out a little bit and then it kind of tucks back away and it'll start peeking mm-hmm. out a little bit again later. And it's just, them finding and the ultimate collection is so cool because after every issue uh eastman and in some of them layer like talk about making that issue and so you just hear them being like yeah we didn't really have individual personalities for the turtles that much in issue one except raph was the aggressive one yeah. and then they start like going and it's like you get to the raphael one shot where they like the raphael one shot i think is just a genius piece of work because it it's... is like just how do we experiment with raph as, as a character this angry brutal character um it's like let's just give him a worse version of himself <laughs> to deal with and show him like this mirror of like, this is how your brothers see you. Mm-hmm. And like, now you have to come to terms with that. And it's like, for freaking the, the, the fourth issue they did, them making a joke because everybody was doing mini series. And so they're like, we'll do, you know, a, a, a micro one issue series. <laughs> micro series. And, and, and yet they land on something that I think, in my opinion, is probably the best of these four issues. I really do like issue one as well. I was going to say, I, I, issue one is just too good to be. Issue one's so good. Because issue one is just a one shot. Like, issue one is not, once we hit issue two, we start hitting like, okay, now it's going to be a series. But issue one was just, it is what it is. Like, that's the story. The Shredder, you know, we spoil back issue reviews. If you somehow have not heard of this and you're a Turtles fan at this point, crazy. The Shredder dies in the first issue of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is crazy for one of the most iconic, you know, comic book supervillains of all time. <laughs> But, yeah, no, it's just, I love the Raph one-shot so, so mm-hmm. much. Because I think it's really where they start. It's where they go from just really, really talented creators, I think, to also really figuring out the characters that they are. You know, mm-hmm. right. No, and I, I think that one thing with the, the Raph one-shot is that, I don't remember if it's in issue three or in that one, but we do see more of the personalities coming through, especially, I think, for Leo. Uh, like, from my Raph? limited... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, from yeah. my limited uh, turtle exposure, Leo <laughs> is my favorite. Uh, I should have worn blue today. I wore red like a fool. Uh, it's okay, because at this point, Leo they're all wearing favorite. red 
uh, in their black and white uh, yes, book. Yes. Um, but I, I think his personality really starts to come through as well. Like you were yeah. saying that it, it picks up so quickly, which is again, such what baffles me about this is that I guess I'm not super familiar with them outside of their turtles work. Had they like been working in comics uh, or in Laird, TV yes. or Kevin Eastman? No. Peter Laird's a little bit older. He had been doing, I want to say, like, newspaper comics and comic strips mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And Kevin Eastman uh, had just kind of started getting into comics. Like, Kevin Eastman was pretty young at this point. Um, but, but even, yeah. like, it's crazy to see how much... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say something and then speak on it to see if I can really okay. get to it again. Okay. It feels That's right. very modern for something that was made in the 80s. 84. Like, yeah. Uh, like, obviously, in the 90s, years. we had our explosion of, uh, or, like, huge explosion of, like, really bombastic paneling and really yeah. crazy, uh, crazy action. But it feels so outside the mold, kind of like what you were saying with uh, them not following the, the typical structure, which, again, is just bonkers to me for to create it. Like, you, you know, you, you see that with, like, Jim Lee or Rob Liefeld or Todd McFarlane, and it's yeah. like, oh, yeah, they they kind of know the rules and break the rules from that. Like, they, yeah. they decide that they want to do something outside what they've already been doing or what they've been told to do. Nobody told these guys to do anything. They're just doing no. it in such a cool way right out yeah. of that. Like, no... It feels like no risk is too big. Yeah, and they they're just no. willing to take them all. No, I fully, I I I, I fully agree with that. It, it's it's like like you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Issue issue three was literally Kevin Eastman going. They don't really do car chases in comic books. Let's do a sixteen page long car chase in this. What's comic What's crazy book. is that that's what made me so excited when you said we were going to read this because. Probably like four years ago now, Deep Katie and Joseph Lore, we were talking about a car chase in some comic. And I was like, yeah, yeah it just felt like really lame. I don't know. And yeah. you're like, oh, well, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles chase. has the yeah. greatest car chase in comic books in like the it's third true. issue. Fully I true. am inclined to agree. <laughs> it's so good. It's so high energy. It's so creative as well, which I think is yeah. something that we lose with a lot of uh, a lot of car uh, car chases. <laughs> Shout out to Petrolhead for never being. I was going to say, I feel like Petrolhead is the only other time I've actually even liked a car chase in right? comic books. Like, and it's that's not like shitting on the creators who've done it. It's just no, really no. freaking hard to do a car chase in a static medium because yeah. car chases don't have like impact frames, like. In a fight, that works in comic books because you hit the mm -hmm. impact moments or you hit the post-impact moments. Car chases don't have impact moments, so it's like, how do you get the fluidity? And the answer is, you do what Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird did, which is these super dynamic panels that have, like, these cool swerves, and you have these cuts in and out of the cabin of the van, mm -hmm. and just, you have really exciting characters that, their yeah. personalities all throughout the car chase, too. And, um, yeah, so good. It's so you know, good. that chase, I am... Just mind boggled by it because again, it's one of those things for you to where... that chase for so long. <laughs> <laughs> again, I think it might have been literally within the first year of our friendship that you told yeah, me about it. I was like, oh, maybe ago. I'll check it out. Uh, <laughs> but it's just, it is probably my favorite sequence in the entire bit that we read. Like so much of the yeah. action is cool. Like the fight with uh, Shredder and the Foot Clan, super the fight rad. With Shredder, just so it's good so i can't good. not but love the it. car chase is just insane and the way that they work with it in the plot is also bonkers to me uh because the turtles are you know they're they're absconding from their base because the the mousers have revealed them essentially or they will if they don't leave um yeah and so they get into april's van and turns out 20 minutes before an identical van robbed a bank and so they end up with this really intense situation of like, oh shit, the cops are gonna like get us because they, and they're gonna find the turtles, which is yes, yeah, like we can't just stop and let them know that it's not us because we have ninja turtles in the van. exactly. But then they meet up with the other van, and I think that's the other big thing about car chases is that they can resolve so boringly. Like yes, 
if you get away, that's that's boring. Like you, yeah. Maybe you blow up a bunch of cars or something, and you uh, are able to drive off, and like maybe that's a bit more exciting. But this was so good because it, it just it was again such a clever way to end it in a way that felt very narratively satisfying. Like it felt like there's a reason that they got away. Yes. No, it's not to I, mention I like how you, funny yeah. the page with the bank robbers is. Oh, uh, it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's every cop saying a different version of don't move. <laughs> and they get just more and more ridiculous as you go down the page. It's because that's the other thing is that this I expected this to be darker because you've told me that the you know the Ninja Turtles are not, you know. Yeah. They're not, you know, they're not cartoons, especially in the comics. No. Uh I was so pleasantly surprised by how funny a lot of it still was. Oh yeah, it's just more like it's more mature humor. Like like maybe not mature. It's like immature. It's just it's more made for adult humor. Exactly, like the, it's know. more subtle humor. Yeah, uh, where it's like when the uh, Master Splinter is explaining uh, the backstory of the turtles, and he's like, "And you started to grow, and you started to speak, and they say like the stupidest shit in the world." It's like pizza, yeah. hang loose. Like that's just objectively funny. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, it just just to land on this page, it's halt, don't move, hold it, make my day, punks, stop, aha, uh-huh, freeze, cease and assist, remain motionless, do not ambulate, <laughs> do not ambulate. <laughs> I love that page. One of my favorite pages in in the book. Yeah, it's it's just such a good uh, a good understanding of humor writing as well. The way that things build on yeah. each other and patterns form and and. Like every it's funny when it can bit be funny. of this book. Exactly. Every bit of this book feels so competently made. In just the like every, which is absurd to say cuz not every book is going to have, you know, the best action sequences or the best, you know, quiet scenes and and whatnot. And I will say personally the the art style uh for the humans specifically is not like my favorite. I think that they look a little, uh, a little stiff, maybe, uh, and a little grungy. But uh, the way that the art looks, look one good. for the turtles and two for the settings, bonkers. Yeah. The amount of detail put in here, and again, there's such a, there's such an added level of impression when you can really, truly see the hand-drawn lines on the page. Yes. Like, I have nothing but respect for digital artists. Absolutely. Uh, many of my favorite artists are digital artists. Uh, it's bonkers to see all this with, like, the ink of the pen. Yeah, no, fully agree. I mean, like, so much of the way that they draw is, like, based on, like, sketch art is, like, the inverse of the way I think you're supposed to. Like, if you look at, like, the way they draw hair a lot of the time, like, it's like, ah, oh, you're supposed to draw, like, the shape of hair and then, like, you know, add... Stri- like, they do a scribbly hair, you know, where it's, like, you can see all the lines coming out. Like, it's just, it's really cool, it's really fluid, and it's 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 very much them, and I love it. It's it's probably my favorite art style ever. I love... Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird are two of my favorite artists ever. I think that it's awesome. It's great. And the, the one other thing I want to talk about... Um, there's actually two other things I want to talk about. Mm-hmm. One will be a quicker thing after. You talk about, like, the setup to issue three, which is, like, uh-huh. you know... A, another van that looked exactly like their van being the, the setup to every issue with the exception of issue one is fairly stupid but it yes. just works so well because they kind of know how stupid it is and then just deliver mm-hmm. a great story like the baxter stockman one is literally they have such an easy thing of like oh no he could just rob he literally goes no i don't want the money i just want to do it because it's fun like that is so stupid but then it comes across and it builds his character it is mm-hmm. so such a cool thing and then issue three is we talked about you know literally a van that looked exactly like criminal's van and then issue four is literally casey's motivation which is the funniest thing in the world not he doesn't have a tragic backstory he's not a vigilante who lost his family it's he loves cop movies and gets way too invested in them and goes i'm gonna do that i'm gonna be that guy like such dumb setup but in the best way Mm -hmm. like they are so aware of what they're doing and that makes it so good and i think that uh just because we talked about it earlier in the episode it's the kind of finesse talent like we were talking about with the detective chimp story in the April special where the setup is kind of dumb and like you it's it's really the story they're telling 
in like the meat of it that really grips you. Uh, because yeah. one of the one of the notes that I wrote was like, ah, I don't really like this. Uh, uh, the 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 tech dude's name, you Baxter just, Stockman. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I was like, uh, Baxter's TV like kind of, uh, you know, evil cackle was a bit much. Yeah, cartoonishly and, like, evil. Exactly. Um, but it's something that I didn't even think to bring up again because everything around it works so well that it yeah. it kind of is such a little one-off moment that then when you see his villainous actions in action, you forget that he started as this, like, I don't know, weird boob of a man. Yeah. I, I Okay, I've got I, I got a question for you that I want to ask. But first okay. I want to just hit off, like, one of the things that I think is such a testament to this is that these four issues, and it really is these four issues, because the bit after is awesome and I love it, but it's something that really only came into 2003 in terms of, like, straight adaptation. But these mm. four issues have been nearly one-to-one, like, matched in almost every single Ninja Turtles property. Like, April's origin has been changed in some of them, but, you know, this is a fairly one. Like, Baxter Stockman like this. Issue one, Oroku Saki, Hamada Yoshi, like, slight changes pretty much has been like that in every iteration. And Casey's introduction is almost exactly the RAF one shot in nearly, like, it's it, that in the in the movies. It's that in uh, the 2003 show. It's that in the IDW comics. Like, all of them just... These four issues stand the test of time so well, they can just grab them for almost everything, which I think is such a testament. But I want to ask you a question because we yes. haven't touched on it because it's such a little thing, but I loved it because I remember when I read this for the first time, just loving the moment so much. How did you feel about the Utram reveal at the end of uh, issue three? It's the, the aliens. Remind me with the are like, uh, the guys. Oh, with the brains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was bunk because I <laughs> was very worried about Splinter. Um, like, you know, if he has fur, I'm going to love him. I, it, <laughs> Splinter is essentially my dog for this, uh, for this comic. I was so worried yeah. about him. I was convinced that he had, like, drowned and died. The entire sequence is so interesting because you immediately get that sense when he's picked up by these, like, sanitation workers just like, your they're age, talking yeah. weirdly. Like what the, the they're kind of odd. What's what's up with this? And I had no idea what was coming because I am a turtle noob. Um it was it's one of those things where the visuals of it are so silly. Cause they're like oh, brains yeah. sitting on a table. Yeah. But it was so exciting. It's like Jesus fucking what? Right. <laughs> It's so cool. I love I love so that cool. moment so much. Yeah. Because like I had when I was reading this, I had like my vague memories of the two thousand three show from when I was mm-hmm. a kid where I was like, I kind of remember Utrams, but not really. And this was it, it was just such a cool moment. But it really was. Yeah. I, I love that so much. I love and that sets up the next arc, which is just where they took the turtles from like the turtles are a little weird, but the rest of the world's fairly normal around them. And it's just like this gritty, you know, vigilante comic book with turtles. And isn't that silly? To like, the next arc just goes, no, we're just going to do some wild ass shit. <laughs> and I, 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 no, I, and I love that. I'm sure we will read it at some point, whether in another back issue or a bonus episode or whatever the hell mm-hmm. we do. But I'm sure we'll read that arc at some point. No, I am. I am so jazzed. This is, it's really amazing how, like, if someone asked me where to start reading Batman, I wouldn't say Detective Comics number 27. I tell everyone the Mirage TMNT. <laughs> it's it's so good so immediately, which is just not fair. <laughs> and and the crazy thing is, like, I say that with, like, the IDW run is another, like, top-tier comic run ever. And yet I will still say, no, you should go back and read the Mirage run first because, God, it's so good. It holds up so well. It does. It holds up incredibly well for something made in, in 84. But mm-hmm. anyway, do we want to get to rating and lists? Let's get to ratings and lists. I'll, I, let, you, I'll let you start us off. I, I hate giving ratings. I'm so bad at it. Uh, I am going to give the Mirage TMNT. I'm going to give it an 8.5 out of 10. I liked okay. it so much. The there were a few artistic hangups, specifically with April and Casey, and uh, I do think that the cartoony nature of 
who essentially was my main villain for this with uh, the, the, the mousers and the such. I do think that that brought it down a little bit for me. Uh, and the turtles not quite having their personalities in place. Like you can definitely see where it's going, but it's, it's a cool, it's a cool book, but maybe, you know, maybe could have used that, that greasing of those wheels a bit. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give it a, an 8.5. How are you doing? That, that's, that's super fair. I think this is one of the greatest comic books of all time. I love this so much. I have landed on a 9.75 out of 10 for See, the See, I'm not the only one who does the quarter ratings. <laughs> um, I just, I had to put it above. I, the, the whole reason for is like, I will never give a 10 because a book could always be better, but I have to, this is better than all the 9.5s I've given. So You're we're absurd. landing on that 9.75 out of 10. Just give it a but, 10. No, because what if something's better? I'm not going to start doing 11s and shit. Like, no. We're give gonna, it a we're 10, you absolutely are. Well. No. Um... And uh, yeah, let's 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 go through our list. What is your list looking like now, Katie? All right, my list is looking like this: uh, number one, Noctera, Full Throttle Dark; number two, The New Teen Titans, Volume One; number three, Above Snakes; number four, Maze Book; number five is where I'm putting the Mirage TMNT. I like them so much; I like them better than Batman and Robin Volume One, which is now number six. Number seven is Chicken Devil Under Pressure; number eight is World's Finest Batman and Superman: The Devil Neza. Uh, tied for number nine are Radiant Black, Not So Secret Origin, and Paper Girls. Wait a minute. What I miss? What I do? Up? I think tied well, for number tie- ten. I think you have a tie oh, for yeah. number nine. They're right? tied so for number nine, which means one yeah, of them counts for number ten. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's Radiant well, what, Black what and Paper Girls. Uh, that bumped off King Spawn Volume One. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I am sh- high praise for you to put this above Batman and Robin. Like I was very, thinking about it, and they they, they fit a they're in a similar kind of space in terms of what the content of the book is, and I yeah. like this better. Okay, I, I I love to see it. My number one is the Mirage TMNT one through three in the Raph one shot. I love this. It's just top tier comic book stuff. Uh, I love Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. Um, number two is Noctera Volume One. Uh, Number three is Batman and Robin, Volume 1. Number four is New Teen Titans, Volume 1. Number five is Maze Book. Number six is Above Snakes. Number seven is Dark Crisis. Number eight is Radiant Black. Number nine is Ultimate Spider-Man. Number ten is King Spawn. And bumped off the list, unfortunately, is Savage Dragon. Baptism. Rip Savage Dragon. Well, that is... uh, That is a... It was a great pick. It really was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But speaking of great picks, we've got a great interview guest. <laughs> <laughs> In our creative corner this week, we are joined by Jonathan Hedrick and Francesca Fintini to talk about their have. new book, Can I Scream? Yes. Very excited for that. So let's move right on over. All right, and here we are in the creator corner where we sit back, relax, talk about comics, talk about being writers, talk to writers and their accompanying artists. That's right. Today we are joined uh, by Jonathan Hedrick and Francesca Fantini, adorable husband-wife combo. We love to see it. Uh, to talk about Can I Scream. Uh, but Jay and I wanted to talk a bit about Can I Scream before we jump into there. Uh, so just as a little rundown for you, uh, Anne O'Brien is trying to protect her 11-year-old son, Thomas, who has an ability to emit a deadly scream. To stay ahead of the government organization that is trying to find them, Anne and Thomas move from one town to the next, never staying too long anywhere. They live off the grid and assume fake identities when needed. Against her better judgment, Anne enrolls Thomas into a public school where his secret slips. This catches the attention of a covert team who wants the young boy for their own corrupt use. As mentioned, uh, this is written by Jonathan Hedrick, who's done Quicksand, Capable, uh, The Recount. The pencils and inks are by Francesca Fantini, who's done Steak and Artemis and the Assassin. The colors are Ruben Curto, and the letters are Leo McGovern. Jay, can I scream? How'd you feel? 
<laughs> I thought you were just gonna like go, can I scream? There's the question. There's the uh, question. No, you can cannot, Katie. You will rupture people listening's eardrums, especially if they are, you know, wearing headphones. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I really like this. Yeah, yeah. I really like this issue. I really like. Can right? I scream? It's. I, I said this shot. issue. It's a one shot. So yeah. this this story, I guess, is how I'll put yeah. it. Or this this. Well, comic it's a the end general. question mark. Decidedly, it's a. It is at the end question mark. But it is. It is. It is currently a one shot. Is what mm-hmm. I'll say, and we'll. Uh, I'm sure dive deeper into that during the interview that we'll jump to in just a couple yes. minutes here. But yeah, I really like this. Uh, I don't want to spoil much because it's not out yet and it's a one shot. So this is, you know, what's going on. But mm. yeah, I thought it was really, um, it was a very exciting story is how right? I put it. Like it is a, a page turning. It's a 32 page or I want to say. It is. Um, but it is one of those just page turner reads that you just kind of fly through in this exciting, uh, very fun way. It's, yeah, a, think, it's a very enjoyable read. Yeah, and I think a big part of that uh, kind of page turnery aspect of it and uh, the energy of it is Fantini's art. I feel like there's yeah. just so much, like there there are no there are no subtle movements. Everything feels very like energetic and personality filled. It's it's like the difference between watching a movie and watching uh, like a play. For, at least that's how I felt when doing it, where it's like, yeah, there's so much emotion happening here. It's all conveyed through the art. And that's uh, not even touching on Hedrick's writing, which is also really, really good. Uh, the kind of crux of the story. Especially the dialogue here. writing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the the heart of the story really is the relationship between this mother and her son. And they, they really feel so realistically mother and son uh, in all of the good and bad ways that you can imagine. Yeah. yeah. I think we both no, liked it I, a whole lot. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we are both thrilled to go talk to the creators. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's, let's hop over now and uh, we can let them talk about their book instead yes. of uh, continuing to gush about it ourselves. So <laughs> uh, we'll see you all in a second with two more people. Okay, we are joined by Jonathan Hendrick and Francesca Fantini uh, for today's interview. They're going to be talking about their new book, Can I Scream, coming out, I think you now said, April 3rd instead of uh, the original date. Right. So uh, Jonathan has worked on uh, The Recount, Dream Master, and Quicksand. And Francesca's work on uh, Artist, uh, uh, is, sorry, is the artist on Stake, Artemis and the Assassin, and Co. Dojo. Thank you two so much for joining us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. Yeah, Mm -hmm. we're excited to be here. So we pretty much start all of our interviews with the same question, um, which is, and and I'll throw it to you guys, and you can take it, you know, however you want between the two of you. But how did you get started making comics? Do you want to go first? You go first. Okay. (laughs) Um, I started making comics about five years ago. Um, I took a. uh, I've always been a writer in some capacity. You know, when I was in grade school, my teachers would always tell me, hey, you're good at writing. You should do something with that. And when you're in school, you know, no one dreams of being a writer. You know, you have more um, grandiose aspirations. You know, no one has their favorite writer, you know, a poster on the, their wall. Right. Um, so I didn't even know like what to even do. And it, I just shrugged it off. But. I always, you know, wrote things down in composition books. Um, you know, my answers on tests were always too long. I remember, um, you know, uh, teachers marking me off for using too many words. So, um, I, and then in my 20s to 30s, I started writing to submit to short story form, like magazines and websites, but nothing came of it. Um, you know, I, I would shelve it all, put it, you know, try it again like a year later after getting some motivation, and then shelving it all again. But then um, one day I decided to take one of my short stories and, that was, you know, written more of a prose format and try to uh, adapt it to a comic book script. Um, and I did that. And then once I had the script done, I was like, what do I do with it next? So... You know, I researched and asked around on how to self-publish a comic book. 
um, learn that, you know, stumble through that process, made m m mistakes, but, you know, eventually I had the actual comic book in my hand and, and that's when I felt like I, I cracked the code, you know, like, okay, I can do this. And I wrote another script that followed by another and things just kind of fell into place after that, you know, and I've just been, um, grinding through it since then. Super it's awesome. Rad. Uh, how about you, Francesca? So I, I will start to say I apologize for my English <laughs> because oh, I'm still learning mm -hmm. and I improve myself. It's difficult. Sometimes I misspell word and mix with Italian. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so my um, career mm -hmm. was uh, totally different. My idea, my first idea was uh, like uh, work like a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I start just for, uh, like, uh, I can say, with a contest, an Italian mm -hmm. contest. I said with myself, ah, let's try it is and uh, let's see how it go. And uh, they pick me, pick me like artist. And uh, so I start in this way. And then uh, I never like uh, stop looking um, um, for a publisher uh, online, like research. And uh, my first uh, um, American publisher was uh, Advent Comics. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Aftershock, and uh, I'm here. <laughs> Katie's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> God, my, my former, I, Aftershock Comics is my <laughs> first indie loves in, in, uh, yeah. in indie comics. Great books, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we've heard from a number of creators that their significant others are some of their best and harshest critics. <laughs> uh, what's it been like for you guys working together and collaborating with your partner on a book? Do you think there are any unique advantages or disadvantages to that setup? Is there anything that you liked working out with me on Can I Scream? Uh, I mean, like, uh, is stay close <laughs> <laughs> to work together you know yes, just in yes. general it uh, yeah. was you know very rewarding mm -hmm. um you know uh, and yeah just to be able to bounce things off of each other mm -hmm. um w it was really cool um you know not that the, it wasn't challenging either you know there was you know some some pages and panels where we were like you know yeah, so had cool. to you know um compromise on and, and you know um, I give a little more art direction um, things like that but uh, it, it really turned out to be a beautiful comic book and I'm so happy that we you know went went you know through with it and hopefully we can do it again sometime soon <laughs> absolutely I mean I, I I'll speak my own personal opinion having you know you guys sent us a, a, an advanced copy thank you very much i thought it was awesome i loved oh, it same. thank you uh, yeah so i think that uh you know the process worked very well in the end product there but awesome. uh kind of speaking of the end product um the ending is i'd say open for continuation is how i'll, I'll put it so are there any plans whether immediate or in the future to continue can i scream well um Speaking of Aftershock, um, Can I Scream uh, originated as a, a, a pitch I sent to uh, Aftershock years ago when they invited me to pitch to them. Um, and, you know, fast forward, you know, uh, it d didn't pan out with any of my pitches. But the good thing about that, my, my experience pitching probably like 10 the, uh, books to Aftershock is now I have 10 pitches, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, 10 things that I've put a yeah. lot of effort into, I, uh, you know, um, and the only thing that's stopping me from making those is time and the funding. And I've already made some of those um, into comic books already. Like Quicksand, w uh, which was published by Scout, was my first pitch to Aftershock. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with it so much that I was like, you know what? I'm going to make this on my own. You know, I invested so much into that pitch, just like I did with all the other ones. Um, and now look, you know, now it, it was released in, in stores um, last year, all five issues, you know, and I crowdfunded two of them uh, successfully. And those were like my best um, crowdfunding campaigns. So 
I digress, but uh, Can I Scream was one of my earlier pitches to them, and it was pitched as a miniseries, just like mm -hmm. most of everything. You know, I, I think I also told them it could I could make it work as one of their um, after uh, after how would they call it one shocks, which yeah. was like a a, a meteor um, one shot. But um, yeah, there's definitely possibility for more Can I Scream, um, you know, and I've been called out um, respectfully on how many one shots I have. And, um, you know, in my defense, and I, I don't think I have to defend myself, but um, just since we're talking about it, is it's, it's easier to get these one shots out and have a story. Uh, and if people want more, that's a good problem to have, you know, okay. um, Absolutely. In, in the indie comic book world, it's, it's so hard to make just a mini series and get it out on time within the same year, or within, you know, one month apart from each other. And it's a long, long investment. You know, it's like, do you, all right. Do you want me to crowdfund one issue, one a year for five years, and then you finally get all five? Or how about I give you like a very like episodic, you know, Twilight Zone, Outer Limits style or, you know, Black Mirror style story that, you know, it's enough to chew on. And if you want more, you know, show me at, you know, with the sales that you want more and then I'll invest, you know the time, resources, finances, and, and get you more of them. So, you know, uh, I, for most of my one shots, I, th I could probably expand upon more of them, you know, like, but some of them, I, I'm like, no, that was it. Didn't you read the ending? Like, um, uh, hyper aware for source point press. Mm -hmm. That was like, that was one and done. People were like, want to know what happens. I'm like, did you read what? <laughs> There's not much. That's going to be a very boring sequel. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I would love to do more. Can I scream? Um, it just definitely is, would probably never be a, you know, once a month book um, right. without us getting like a, 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 a dump truck load of money, just kind of like, all right, guys, <laughs> take time off of work and everything else you do and make this comic book. And that's not going to happen, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so maybe. But what I'm doing there is people need to go out and buy Can I Scream so that there can be more. So. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so go do that if you're, if you're listening to this. <laughs> uh, yeah, you are, it's, it's coming out soon. It's coming out from Keen Spot, uh, which yes. isn't a publisher that I was super familiar with. It looks like they do a lot of uh, webcomic work and are breaking more so into uh, the physical copies. How did you right. end up landing there? Well, um, uh, Francesca uh, last year did some variant covers for a keen spot book called Rebel Girls. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about oh, that at all? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, she was um, the variant artist, but they, and it was, it's a great series, but they really pushed Francesca's covers, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in all the marketing and um, even that, I believe it was San Diego Comic Con last year. Keen Spot had a presence there. They had a booth, which, first of all, uh, if any indie publishers are listening to this, make more of an effort to go to conventions in the big ones like San Diego Comic Con. You know, don't send. You know, uh, be there. Uh, CEOs and presidents and editors and stuff. Anyways, that that's my. Um, soapbox about that but i was impressed that keen spot was there and not only were they there but they had like a big banner of francesca's cover right there and see i'm pretty sure it was san diego yeah, yeah so she didn't have to pay for that banner the publisher paid for that banner and anytime i see that type of effort from a publisher to market i i want to work for them you know uh i've worked and been published by the other publishers and not, they're not all like this, but mm -hmm. I feel like I'm pull, pulling all the weight when it comes to marketing. And that's not fair. You know, it, it should be, it should be shared, you know, yeah. it, uh, but it is what it is. So when, um, you know, we, when we, when we had enough pages done to start pitching, um, 
Keen Spot was on the top of our list. Yes, we did give it to a few other, you know, um, you know, uh, publishers too. Mm -hmm. But Keen Spot got back to us, and we were happy with that. We didn't wait to hear back from any other ones, and they, they've been great to work with. Um, I already have a, a second title in, that's um, in talks with them. I, we haven't signed the paperwork, um, but I've already. Uh, that just, I'm just. Um, you know, illustrating like how much I'm willing to give it back to Keen yeah. Spot because of this. I mean, I picked up, we were at the uh, comic book store the other day and I picked up one of their other books mm -hmm. that recently came out. We opened it up and in the back was an ad for our comic. I mean, that's, that's, that's great, so you know, and that's easy too, you know, and to, to think like, I was surprised to see that shows how bad some of the other publishers <laughs> are at marketing. Like how hard is it? We're, you, you already have the artwork. You already have the logos. You already have the, the vehicle to advertise. You know, I'm not, no one's asking you to reinvent the wheel uh, and be the next Don Draper, you know, from Mad Men and create a new marketing style campaigns, pay a little bit extra, and, and put it in the back or put it, you use the inside back cover or something and mark what, what you have next. It's, it's not, not that hard. Way, so it uh, makes a huge difference for creators as well. Feel it appreciated like that. That's so cool. And I can see why they would choose your art for their banners. <laughs> your characters are just, they're so expressive and there's so much energy on the page. It was really one of the highlights of reading it. Anytime, uh, uh, either character would have like a big reaction to something. You could really feel how much emotion is in their their expressiveness Absolutely. and their action. It's great comic book art. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so when you were uh, pitching, you obviously had that connection there with Keen Spot, uh, and you you've both made names for yourselves in the industry as you are already. Do you have any advice for people who would be looking to pitch to? you know, to Keemspot or to any other publisher? Uh, you want to answer that, babe? I don't want to uh, hog all, like, advice on how to pitch to publishers. Uh, I will just be short and say, never give up. Uh, always, like, send email. Uh, of course, don't, like, uh, maybe... Uh, I can say be rude. Yeah, don't be rude. Don't be, be, be rude, uh, just be patient. Um, Yes, yeah. I hope you go. <laughs> yeah, I'll echo everything she said and, and add on the, cal the uh, caveat of research what the publisher has. Um, they all have their own submission guidelines or none at all, you know, or they're not accepting submissions. Um, it, there's the three P's, be persistent, polite, and patient, you know. But um, I'll also look at what, the publisher has published and what they're currently publishing. And like, is, does the publisher ha already have, are you about to pitch them a unicorn book and they already have three unicorn books? That either means they have their fill of unicorn books or that submission team really likes unicorns. <laughs> I, I could go either way for you. Um, so I don't know, you know, I. I Sometimes I wish I was a fly on the wall in these um, uh, submission team meetings. Like, what what are you guys thinking? You already have five books with a crazy rabbit. I mean, <laughs> how many more do you do you need of these? And um, you know, speaking of aftershock, uh, when I would get my like, not I want to say a critique, but like feedback when they would say no. Um, and some of the responses were like, really, are, are, are you not being, are you trying to be kind? Because that doesn't make sense. You know, like, uh, we're worried about people predicting the ending. Well, that's what a good editor does then. And a good editor fixes that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I also heard, you know, oh, we already have a, a book like that in, in in the pipeline. And I've years later, I've not seen that book, <laughs> you know? Um, so, uh, it, yeah, it can be extremely frustrating. Um, I've had more pitches and submissions denied than I've had accepted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then and with that being said, look at uh, search my name on Previews World, and you'll see how many titles I have. Now, 
multiply that by 20. That's how many <laughs> no's I got or, or silence, you know, I'm right. still, I, I, I've had publishers, um, ask me to pitch to them. I do. And it's nothing I'm like, did, did they get the email or not? Do they hate me? Am I going to uh, get a surprise? You know, it's a year later, who knows, but it, it's a tough, this is a tough industry. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, in all sides of it for the retailers, for the creators, even, you know, the fans too, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's tough. So don't be discouraged if you're uh, pitching to publishers, um, just keep at it. And, you know, there's a lot to be said about self-publishing, you know, there's books out there. I wish I had the rights back to, or um, never even, uh, bothered to publish because I could have done more self-publishing than I could have with a publisher. The direct market isn't what it's all cracked up to be. So, well, kind of uh, spinning out of that, you have a pitch that did get you know accepted. Obviously, can I scream? If you now ha want to you know pitch it to our listeners, watchers at home, how would you you know try to get convince them that this is the book that they should buy? You want to explain what Canada Screen is about, or do you want me to? Do okay. <laughs> uh, I will let you do the hands off. <laughs> all right, my my elevator pitch uh, for Can I Scream is all has been um, it's a love letter to Stephen King's Firestarter. So if you're familiar with that story, um, you know it. You'll see some uh, parallels with that. But um, longer pitch is uh, this. Um, Mother and her young son, they're on the run. Um, they assume uh, fake identities. They go from town to town, uh, never staying too long because the boy has this um, uh, deadly superpower, if you will, where he has like a banshee cry that he can't control. And he's going through puberty. He, he has emotions. Um, so every time the secret gets out, they got to leave town because they know that there's a secret organization that's uh, hot on their, their trail. So we see this mother and son in this like 24 hour time and just how much could happen in just a short amount of time in, in their challenging um, life. So it's um, it, in the heart of it, it's a, a, a mother and son story, you know, um, I was um, brought up by a single mother and I put a lot of that into it. There's frustrations that, you know, uh, there's love at the same time. There's like, I hate you. I love you. And, and you, uh, it, from one hour to the next, you can go to one extreme to the other. And uh, it's, it, it's challenging, but um, now add in, you know, that supernatural element to it all too. So no, yeah, the dynamic uh, between the characters in the book, it feels so real and so, um, so just <laughs> relatable is weird when uh, the, the son yeah. has a deadly scream, uh, right, but really right. they are just such well-written, well-portrayed, real characters. It's really, really Th great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, but I think that's going to wind us down towards the end here uh, in our creator so. corner. Uh, did you guys awesome. want to shout out any uh, any events you're going to be at, any uh, signings? We have uh, April 3rd as the current release date for Can I Screen? Yep. Um, we're going to be at our local comic book store, Famous Faces and Funnies, on March 27th, uh, which was the original release date. It could still have some copies there. We're bringing copies in case um, the store doesn't have any. We'll have copies on hand. Then we're going to be at Gotham City Limit in Jacksonville, Florida, that following Saturday on March 30th. I'm looking at my calendar for my cheat sheet. <laughs> then April 6th, we're going to be at Blackbird Coffee in Comic and Coffee House in Maitland, Florida. Lots of Florida shows. Sorry, guys. Um, April 13th, we're going to be in Famous Faces and Funnies 2 in Boynton Beach, which is closer to South Florida. Then April 20th, we'll be at Dark Side Comics in uh, Sarasota, Florida. So we're kind of, we're hitting, um, we got North Florida in Jacksonville. We got South Florida in Boynton Beach. We got East Florida. We're, we're, 
where we're at right now. Maitland is in, in Orlando and Sarasota is on the west side of Florida. So if you're a Flor Floridian, you, can, you should be able to catch <laughs> us at one of those. If you're, you know, it's April, it's nice and hot here. So if you're not in Florida, come down uh, and hang out with us. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thank you guys so much again for joining us. And I think that's going to bring us to a uh, conclusion on the interview. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. What an awesome interview. Thank you so much again to Jonathan and Francesca for coming on to talk about Can I Scream. Remember, orders are coming up. Uh, we're looking at April 3rd as of right now. Uh, and don't forget, if you're in Florida, to go check them out at one of their various signs. They're covering basically the entire state. Yeah, honestly. So if you're around there, pop in, see them. Um, but this past Saturday, we also posted a bonus episode that you guys might want to check out. Mm -hmm. We read every DC Rebirth number one, so you don't have to. Part two, tackling Justice League through Wonder Woman. So our tier list is finally full of all 28 uh rebirth number one comics which was honestly a really really fun time it was such do. a fun time and that tier list is available we'll link it uh we'll link yes. it on the pod here so you can go and fill out your own tier list be sure you tag send it to us if you do we are always excited to argue with people about books <laughs> yeah yeah um but we'll uh of course have our regularly scheduled episode next wednesday uh, we where will. we will be pulling a number of books jaybird what are we pulling? We're going to have Morningstar, number one, uh, from Mad Cave. We're going to have Green Arrow, number 10. The Six Fingers, number two. Ultimate Spider-Man, number three. And Zorro, Man of the Dead, number three as well. Of course, in addition to our polls, we will have a back issue review for you. It's going to have a tough one to follow up from this week. But oh, what, are yeah. you, what are you throwing at us, Katie? Here's the thing. I'm not, I'm not going to try to follow up. Because, uh, you know, <laughs> comparing anyone to TMNT is just rude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are going to be reading Pretty Deadly uh, by Kelly Sue DeConnick and Emma Royce. It's, uh, it's an image book. It's cowboy core. Uh, and it's a little, a little spooky, if I'm not mistaken. A little spooky. A little spooky. Yeah, little I have not spooky. read it, but I am very excited to okay. check it out. I've, I've obviously not read it. If, if, if Katie's picking it and, and she hasn't read it, you know. Uh, that'd be pretty but, wild. Yeah, that'd be pretty wild if you picked the book that I've read, but not <laughs> you. That'd be an interesting way to go. But yeah, uh, I'm excited for that, as I am for the rest of the episode. Again, you can check out our bonus episode this past Saturday, or you can check out another interview this upcoming yes. Saturday, where we will have Lewis Southern on to talk about Comics Are Dying, the comic. Yes, yes. Um, we, we intended to have him on for a creator corner, but had too much fun chatting and ended up going way too long to fit it in a regular episode. Yes. So if you want that extra long, I think hour long video, it's going That'd to be, be a bonus episode to. coming out this Saturday. Check that out. But if you don't check out either the bonus episodes, or even if you do, check out our full episode next Wednesday, same time and place. We'll see you next week. Comic Geeks. You know that the reason that they are, instead of just the Power Rangers, the mighty morphing Power Rangers is because of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? We need like a four word we need, thing. We need that rhythm. So it became mighty, mighty morphing. Mighty morphing Power Rangers. Yeah.